All right, we got a Toyota here. It's got a check engine light. Yeah, yeah, don't tell Scotty. Uh, let's check it out, see what we got. Now, normally, I'd use the Autel MS906 to look at codes and help me diagnose things. Today, we're going to use this Autel AL319, see if this thing can help us diagnose this vehicle. All right, first thing we'll do, we'll hook up this little code reader and scan for codes, see what we got going on. Uh, in general, your DLC or data link connector will be somewhere under the dash on the driver's side right here in most vehicles. That's where OBD says it's supposed to be located. And right here, we'll go ahead and hook it up. All right. Now, that usually will power up your, your uh, scan tool, or in this case, code reader, just by plugging it in. But uh, we need to turn on the key before we're going to read anything. All right, we're just going to take the key. We're going to turn it on, but we're not going to start the vehicle. We're just going to turn it on so we can talk to this engine computer. All right, as you can see, it's a bit crude. We only have three buttons right here. So I'll keep you focused right there so that way you can see what I'm doing. Right now, we're just going to hit enter and let it uh, try to see what protocol this vehicle is using. All right, there we go. First thing we can do is read codes. So we'll go ahead and click that, read codes. We got stored, pending, and previous. We'll just go with what's stored. And we got a P0171, System 2 Lean, Bank 1. Now this is a four-cylinder engine, so there's only one bank. But uh, we, got a lean, we got a lean code here. All right, now that you see a P0171 system too lean, what does that mean? Basically, in quick terms, it just means we have an air or a fuel problem. Um, in order for a vehicle to run, it wants 14.7 parts of air per one part of fuel. So in this case, we either don't have enough fuel getting up into the engine, or we have too much air getting into the engine, and it's throwing off that air-fuel uh, mixture. So uh, let's check some more things out see what we can find. Now, we would like some direction, which way to go. Do we want to turn right, or do we want to turn left, or do we want to go straight ahead? That's kind of uh, where we're at right now. And so one of the ways that can help us decide which direction we're going to go is to view the fuse frame. <laughs> if I could say it right, we're going to view the freeze frame right there. And basically what OBD2 is required to do is when the check engine light sets, it takes a snapshot of all the operating parameters. And uh, so we'll go take a look at that and see what it's going to tell us. All right, let's see what this tells us. What was going on when this P0171 set? All right, we were in closed loop, so that means the vehicle was using the oxygen sensors to tell it what uh, air-fuel ratio to use. That's a good clue. Uh, let's see. Our load on the vehicle was 10.6%, which is not much. Um, the next one down is our coolant temperature sensor, and we were at 185. That's a good data PID to look at. Um, that tells us the vehicle was fully warmed up, so we don't have to worry about trying to find this problem on a cold engine. So that's a good clue. Um, the next two data pits, that's going to be our short-term uh, fuel trim and our long-term fuel trim. And you can see right there, 39.8 and 19.5. That's huge. Those are huge numbers. What is that? Uh, about 60% almost, 59%. Um, so there, that was definitely a lean condition. The computer was having to add almost 60% more fuel to get this vehicle um, to run correctly. Uh, let's see. At uh, our RPMs, 696. So the RPMs were right where they're supposed to be. This vehicle should idle between 650 and 750. So 700 is perfect. You can see that uh, we weren't moving, so it was uh, sitting still. 
So that's a good clue. This is an idle problem right here. We weren't moving and our R RPMs were at idle. Our intake ter air temperature was at 84 degrees. And that's it. That's all we got. But those are some excellent clues. We can see that uh, basically this set on a warm engine, we had high fuel trims, and uh, we were at an idle, not moving. So those are excellent, excellent clues to give us direction. All right, one more thing I want to look at while I have the key on and the engine off. Let's go into live data. I want to see the mass airflow grams per second. I want to see it in the 0.4 to 0.5 range. I don't want to see anything ridiculous. Uh, let's see. Now, in this little autel, I have to change the unit of measure to metric so I can see that in grams per second. And we'll just scroll down. Let's see, where are you at? There we are. Mass airflow grams per second, 0.5. So we want to see a 0.4 or 0.5 right in that range on most of these Toyotas. And so we're looking good right there. What we don't want to see is like a zero or 200 or 45 grams per second or just something weird like that where we know with the engine off, we shouldn't be seeing um, very much air movement at all. And so that, that grams per second means we don't have much air movement at all. So we're in the correct range right there. So that's not going to throw our uh, sensors and computer off. Because basically we want to narrow down. Do we have a problem with the fuel getting from the fuel pump into the engine? Do we have a problem with one of the sensors, like a mass airflow or an air fuel ratio sensor? Or do we have a problem with too much air getting into the engine, like pirate air that's unmeasured? And um, when we're dealing with the high fuel trims at an idle, that's usually an indication of a vacuum leak or pirate air after the mass airflow sensor. So let's go check under the engine and see what we can look at. Now we'd like to narrow this issue down. Um, is it a problem with the fuel pump getting fuel up here to the fuel injectors? Is it a problem with the fuel injectors or maybe the uh, the fuel filter down there is it plugged and so it's not allowing enough fuel in there? Do we have a problem with a vacuum leak sucking too much engine or sucking too much air into the engine? Um, do we have a problem with our sensors like our mass airflow sensor or our air fuel ratio sensor that's down there? So that's kind of we, we want to see which way to go. And for me, as a, just as a general practice, I like to do as much looking around as I can before I start the engine. And so one of the best ways to do that is do an actual visual inspection. So let's do a visual inspection of the engine area. And we'll start with the mass airflow sensor, which is over here. It's only two screws and a connector, so we can easily pop that out and make sure we don't have something caught inside there skewing our results. All right, as you can see, Here's our mass airflow sensor. Only takes like 10 seconds to pop out, so it's easy to do a quick visual inspection. Um, and so right here, these little uh, elements right here, that's your intake air temperature sensor. We're not concerned with that right now. It looked like uh, it was reporting just fine. And right here, those two elements right there, one is your mass airflow actual heating element, and then the other one is a little temperature sensor in there to keep that heating element at a certain degree. Um, but basically, we want to look at that and make sure we don't have a bunch of garbage in there, hair, dirt, anything um, trapped in there. This one looks nice and clean. I don't see any issues with that in there. So I don't see anything just with a quick visual inspection that's going to stop this airflow sensor from working. Now if it was dirty and I needed to clean it, I would just use some mass airflow cleaner right here. I would just spray it in, let the stuff fall out. Try not to get, try not to hold it upside down and spray it where stuff is going to go inside where all the, uh, you know, transistors and things are. We're going to spray it like that, let it drain out, and we're going to let this thing sit until it gets good and dry. We do not want to plug this thing in and energize it while it's still wet because then you'll be buying a new airflow sensor. All right, as you can see, I have the mass airflow back installed. And if you didn't know what it does, basically it measures the air that's coming in through this intake tube, and it's converting that to a grams per second and sending it to the computer. And the computer is using that to calculate how much air is actually entering the engine. So as you can see, as long as the air that it's sensing right here is the same amount that's going into the engine, then we're A-OK. -okay. But what if we have a problem after that where air is entering? This airflow sensor is not going to see it. 
So our next visual inspection, we want to look and see if we can find if there's any pirate air going into that that's not being sensed by this airflow sensor. And I'll be honest with you, when I see high fuel trims set a check engine code at idle, the first thing I suspect is pirate air, that we have a vacuum leak or air entering the engine that's not being sensed by this airflow sensor. So that's what we're going to look for next. See if we can find something like that. Now with our fuel trim so high, it's probably going to be a pretty big leak if it was a vacuum leak. And so we definitely want to look at this tube right here. Look on the bottom. Make sure we don't have any cracks or leaks or anything like that. Make sure everything's sealed up. Now this looks good. And then we'll just continue on looking. Now here's an intake tube, just for example. It's not off this truck. But as you can see, you know, this would sit on the vehicle just like this. You look at it, everything looks fine, right? Well, look at that. That would definitely cause a huge air leak, and it would be after your mass airflow sensor if this was a mass airflow sensor vehicle. And so you definitely want to look for something like that. And so this is your PCV back here, right here. You want to look at that hose. We want to look at these vacuum hoses coming off the intake manifold and you can see they go to some uh, valves over here we want to check all these this pipe right here there's a can you see it there's another tube right here so these are all things we want to look at and make sure we don't see any holes or any problems and as you can see I pulled this off right here and I don't know if you can tell but those are this is all frayed and messed up but we're not going to get a huge air leak from that it's probably sealing enough where it's not even leaking yet, but eventually that's going to crack enough where it will. So this hose will definitely need to be replaced, but that's not our problem. And you can take a mirror or run your hand, feel along these things, you know, feel if you can feel anything, like right there. What do we got right here? Ah, that's definitely a problem right there. And then this thing looks like it's... Well, that, does that even stay in there? Not really, so that's probably a contributing factor to why, yeah, this is sliced open. It probably got sliced on this thing because it popped off of there. So that'll have to be fixed. Now that will allow some air to get in there. That's a decent hole, but I don't think it's going to skew our trims more than 30%. So we'll put a piece of duct tape or Gorilla Glue on, on that and keep moving. This is what I use to fix these uh, little hoses on a temporary basis. I just use, use some black Gorilla Tape. Alright, that's the only discrepancy I could find that cut in this uh, vacuum line right here. I did repair it temporarily as you can see, but uh, I don't believe that this is our problem. I don't think that's big enough to create the fuel trims that we are seeing on there. Um, while I'm thinking of it, you can see like these vacuum ports right here aren't used, but you still got to make sure they're capped off so they're not sucking air in. And if you're curious about your vacuum routing, there's usually a sticker or something that will show you how the vacuum is routed on the vehicle. Alright, I'm done with the visual inspection. Now I'm safe. I can fire up the vehicle. And, uh, and in this case, because our check engine light came on when the vehicle is warm, I'm going to let this thing warm up. And then we'll look at some data on, the, um, on our little code reader. Now generally when you see high fuel trims and a check engine light at idle, that usually means some kind of vacuum leak. Um, too much air getting into the system. But we want to uh, look at our live data as we warm the vehicle up and uh, we want to try to eliminate that if we have a sensor issue or some kind of other fuel delivery issue. And so one of the key players is our, uh, you can see it, our engine coolant temperature sensor. You can see we're registering 62 degrees right now. And it's about 70 degrees in the shop right now. So that's uh, not definitely not out of the ordinary that's that's just fine um, we can also look at our intake air temperature sensor too which you can see is right down there at 78 um, so as long as they're fairly close and the vehicle's been off for a while um, then we can be fairly confident that they're both uh, they're both probably working but that engine coolant temperature sensor is a big player in how much fuel um, the engine is going to put in there especially when it's cold so basically as the engine warms up I'll keep an eye on that and just make sure it rises and, uh, and looks normal. And one of the first data pids we want to look for, which it did almost immediately, we want to see our fuel system go from open loop or OL to CL or closed loop. 
and that means we're using the oxygen sensors to determine how much fuel and you can see our engine coolant temperature is rising up I think this thing is working just fine and if our freeze frame data would have showed that this uh, came or the check engine light came on when the engine was cold I'd be trying to find a problem before it warmed up and if you're curious what vehicle it is what engine it's a 2.4 liter as you can see and it's a 2 RZFE but the things I show you on here pretty much be applied to any vehicle all right as you can see we're warmed up we're idling it's idling it feels a bit rough you can see our short term is maxed out at 19.5 percent and if I scroll down and our long term is 39.8 I believe that's the maximum for this vehicle I believe that the combination of the two it won't go any higher all right real quick I'll show you this oxygen sensor this bank one sensor one it's actually an air fuel ratio sensor that's why we're seeing 3.2 3.3 and basically 3.3 is a perfect 14.7 to 1 fuel ratio or stoichiometric and so you can see it's bouncing around right at 3.3 so right now this vehicle is running at a 14.7 to 1 ratio so it's running good it's it's where it's supposed to be but it's having to add a bunch of fuel to get to this point so let's look at the fuel trims at uh, at elevated idle or off idle so there's our short term fuel trim at idle and so what we want to see does it get better or worse or stay the same when we raise it to like 2000 RPMs or something like that and usually if you raise it up and it gets better it's a vacuum leak if you raise it up and it gets worse or stays the same then we either could still have a fuel delivery issue or we have a mass air flow problem so we'll just raise it up can see those fuel trims get considerably better I think we're uh, sure looks like we're dealing with a uh, an air leak somewhere we got a vacuum leak somewhere and go back down to idle we'll see if it corrects back to 19 you can see it's immediately going back to 19 yep so the fuel trims get better with the uh, with higher RPMs and that usually means it's a vacuum leak because the higher the uh, throttle plate is open the less vacuum inside the system so it's not pulling the pirate air from someplace else and here's our long-term fuel trim now this is a learned number over time so when we uh, raise it up if it immediately starts going down that means that it's learned that uh, you know at higher RPMs it doesn't need to add as much fuel so let's see if that also confirms our suspicions and you can see that the fuel trims drop so it's definitely learned over the long term that it can drop the fuel trims I think that confirms or, or starting to confirm our suspicions that we have a vacuum leak somewhere one that we couldn't see visually all right now we still want to confirm whether we have a fuel delivery issue which I don't think we do but we want to confirm it we can look at our air fuel ratio sensor and at 3.3 that's pretty much stoichiometric like we talked about before now if it goes under 3.3 then it's rich if it goes over 3.3 then it's lean and so we want to uh, we'll hit the throttle and try to make it go down under 3.3 and that'll show that we have a rich condition and it'll pretty much show that uh, we won't we don't have a fuel delivery problem and you can see right there we definitely went rich and now we went lean a little bit as it's trying to catch up with the idle now it's back to stoichiometric now also when we do a, um, a snap throttle we should see it go up to like 4.6 or at least over 4 and that um, what that's doing is a fuel cut and that'll confirm that our oxygen sensor is actually working or in this case air fuel ratio sensor so those are all normal results so let's uh, let's verify it 
Yeah, you see how it went up to 4.7, 4.8? That's the fuel cut. It's cutting off the fuel as a, you know, as part of the strategy when you, uh, when it's decelerating. And so basically we just confirmed that I don't believe we have a fuel delivery issue. I don't believe we have an air fuel ratio sensor issue. It looks like we have a vacuum leak somewhere. All right, and while I'm here, one more important data pit that I like to look at is the grams per second on the mass airflow when it's warmed up at idle. And you can see we're at 1.8, and uh, it's a little low. I'd like to see that number a little bit higher um, in the 2 to 3 range. But uh, So we'll have to keep that in the back of our mind. But right now, uh, I'm not too concerned with it, but we'll just have to remember that. All right, let's talk about the long-term and short-term fuel trims. Um, if you don't know what that means, well, we'll talk about it. And in this case, we had a for our short term a plus 19.5. I think that's what the number was. Not, it was close. Same thing with the long term. It was a plus 39.8. What you do is you add those two numbers together, and that's your total fuel trim. That's what this is called, a fuel trim. We're at 59.3%. And so basically, the computer has a bunch of inputs like the mass airflow sensor and the engine coolant temperature sensor. All these inputs are sent into the engine computer or powertrain computer, whatever you want to call it. And it has a baseline. This is how much, this is zero, is our baseline. And this is how much fuel we should be injecting into this engine based on all the inputs coming in. And then once it's doing that, the air fuel ratio sensor or the oxygen sensor, depending on what you have in the vehicle. In this case, this vehicle has an air fuel ratio sensor. It's sending an input into the computer that's telling it whether there's too much fuel or not enough. And so based on this input right here, we're either having to add fuel, which would mean positive fuel trim numbers. So as the numbers go up, like we had on our truck, that would be the computer adding fuel. And if we saw negative fuel trim numbers, then that would be the computer having to take fuel away from its baseline based on all the inputs. So that's in, in a nutshell of what fuel trim should be. Now on a properly operating uh, vehicle, you should be able to add the long term and the short term together and you should get plus or minus 10% when you add them together. That's a good operating uh, vehicle and we don't need to make any corrections and it won't set a check engine light. In the case of this Toyota, anything above 30% um, short term and long term adding them together is going to set a check engine light or anything below minus 35 is going um, to store or set a check engine light and that's of course when you you have to add the short term and the long term together to get those numbers so we have a lot of leeway much greater than the plus or minus 10 percent that most uh, you know most places will teach you so we do have some leeway but as you can see at 59.3 percent that's going to set a check engine light no matter what okay real quick what's the difference between short term and long term why doesn't the computer just have one fuel trim right well basically in order to make the engine run better we want to be able to make quick fast corrections and that's what the short term is there for its job is to make corrections in almost in real time back and forth positive and negative really fast but small corrections to keep it at the proper air fuel ratio the job of the long term is to make this a zero so when when at one point this 39 percent right here was up here on this short term and so what happened get out of here fly you're gonna die fly so what happens is this 39 oh I'm gonna get him I'm gonna get that fly um, this 39 percent is right here and so after a while when this 39 percent sits on the short term for a long time then the long term grabs that number and puts it down here so that this can go back to zero and start making real fast short-term corrections so this long term is learned from this short term over time and so the job of this one is to make this short term a zero so it can make fast corrections so when this is up at 19 percent it's a, it's much harder for it to make uh, corrections it wants to be at zero so it can just go plus or minus really fast and so I believe this 39 percent is maxed out on this vehicle it won't and it varies from vehicle to vehicle but I believe that's a maximum as a um, as a safety precaution so we're not just dumping too much fuel into the engine that's the maximum a long term will do 
and I believe this 19.5% is the maximum combined of what it will do. That's why we wouldn't see it go any higher no matter what. And so right there is our absolute maximum. We can't go any higher. And so that's why this number is not zero and this isn't 59.3 because the computer has to max it out at some point. So real quick, those are your long-term and, sh uh, long and short-term fuel trims so that you have a better understanding. So now we can go back and look at the vehicle and, and at least you'll know what I'm talking about. Now we already did a visual inspection and couldn't find any problems or at least anything that would create a huge vacuum leak. We fixed that little guy right there, but that wasn't the problem. And as you see, I got a water bottle here. It's the best way to find a vacuum leak in, mon in many cases. Not every case, but in a lot of cases. You can use flammable materials too, but you take a chance on catching your vehicle or your house on fire, so I don't recommend that. And so we'll just spray around all the vacuum hoses and everything and see if we can't find a leak. You know? We'll just spray and see if we can't hear stuff getting sucked in. Stuff that we couldn't see on our, on our inspection. And um, if I suspected a, uh, a leak between the intake manifold and the engine, then I would definitely spray there too. But usually those show up when the engine's cold and then as the engine warms up, those two pieces of metal expand and seal off any problems. So usually to find an intake problem, uh, where it's the gasket, you got to do it when the engine's just starting to warm up or on a cold engine. We'll spray it anyway just to see if we hear anything getting sucked in, but at this point I don't. Alright, I sprayed water. I don't hear anything getting sucked in. Um, no change in the engine um, RPMs or anything like that, so I don't think we have an external leak here. So, now what happens if your EVAP system, you know, like your purge, they don't call it a purge, but it, it's basically a purge line. What if that's stuck open and it's just sucking fumes from your charcoal canister? You would think it would drive it rich, and it will just for a second, briefly. But when it sucks all the fumes out of that charcoal canister, then it's just going to continue sucking if it's stuck open, and it's just going to be sucking air. And that air is not going to have any fumes to burn, so it's going to create a lean condition. So this line right here, let's just disconnect it right here. I'll put a vacuum gauge on it so we can make sure we have proper uh, vacuum. And we'll, we'll look at our fuel trims and see if anything changes. And that'll eliminate all this other piping. As you can see from our diagram, it comes in here, goes through this valve, goes back to the canister. From the canister, it comes up to this valve. And from this valve, it goes over to the engine. That's why we're just going to disconnect it from this valve where it goes right to the engine. We'll eliminate all the rest of this crap. All right, I'm just going to take this vacuum and pressure gauge. This one's from OTC. I have a, some adapters on here so I can adapt to that uh, hose right there. We'll just make sure we have proper vacuum, which is anywhere from, you know, 16, 17 up to 21 or 22. Right in that range is the vacuum on most vehicles when it's operating properly. And uh, then we'll check our fuel trims afterwards to see if there's any change, because then we'll have sealed the system from there off. She didn't like that. All right, as you can see, we're sitting at about, what, 18, 18 and a half? So, looks like our vacuum is pretty perfect. No, nothing wrong there. Now let's go look at our fuel trim to see if we made a, a correction. So as you can see, if, you didn't, if you're not following what I'm doing, I just have this sealed off with the vacuum gauge, so now, Everything, we're checking everything after this point to make sure there's no leak. And obviously, we're checking this too, because if there was a leak, we'd probably see a little bit lower vacuum, but we don't. I think uh, any vacuum leak that was right here is now fixed with this Gorilla tape. All right, and looking at our... All right, and as you can see, our short-term fuel trim has not changed. Still sitting at the bottom there at 19.5%. And to make sure our long term hasn't changed. Be nice if we could see both of these on the same screen. Uh, still at 39.8. So we'll leave it here for another minute or two to make sure it doesn't take a second to correct. But at this point, 
does not look like we found our problem. All right, I left it there for a minute. Fuel trims have not changed, so this is not our issue. I'll go ahead and put this back. All right, the other big main line coming into our uh, intake would be this hose right here going to our brake booster. So I'm gonna disconnect it right there and we'll do the same test. Now that hose is fatter, so this one's probably not gonna work. We'll put a little bit fatter adapter on there and we'll check. Oh, she didn't like that either. And let's look and see where our vacuum is. Slightly better, closer to 19, but almost exactly the same. So our vacuum looks good from this point also. Now let's go check our fuel trim, see if we have any corrections. All right, now look at our short-term fuel trim. Drop down to almost negative five, and there's a negative five. We dropped 25, look at that, 26 points, just like that. I think we have a problem with our brake booster. And as you can see, our long term is still at 39.8%, but that's because it's a learned value. So if we let this engine run with the, with the vacuum leak fixed, eventually that's gonna start to go lower too and correct itself. But it would take a while and probably we'd have to drive it a little bit. And you can see just sitting here, our long term's already starting to correct. And you can see our air fuel ratio is just a little bit under 3.3. .3. And so it's definitely running slightly rich. It's going to take a little while for this engine computer to figure out what's going on and make the corrections. All right, now I broke out the big hotel just so we could look at everything on the same screen. Uh, we can do all this stuff on the other one also. But uh, you can still see, even with this fix, we're at 33% and one so we're still at about almost 35 percent actually just about 35 percent positive fuel trim so we still have an issue and if you remember our uh, mass airflow was at about 1.7 1.8 a little while ago and now we're at 2.2 and just a, before i've turned the camera on it was at about 2.8 i think we might still have an issue with the mass airflow um, not reporting exactly and uh, these things it's very critical this mass airflow sensor if it doesn't report exactly if it's just off by a little bit it'll throw the engine computer off so uh, see if we can't do a few more checks on this mass airflow sensor now I'd like to see this uh, mass airflow a little bit higher seems like it's slightly low for my area and these are learned numbers you need to learn it. I mean, two to three is a good range, but I, I would like to see that closer to three here at idle where I live. I suspect it was a little bit lower before we fixed that few, huge uh, vacuum leak, and that was, it was skewing the numbers, just sucking so much air from the brake booster. It was throwing that number down a little bit, so I wasn't as concerned, but I would like to see it up just a little bit higher. Now, let's bring it up this up to about 2,500 RPMs and see not only what our fuel trims do, see if they stay the same, get worse, or get better. And let's see what this grams per second is. In my area, I wanna see closer to nine to 10, right in that range on the mass airflow. So let's bring it up to 2,500. see our fuel trims are almost the same not a huge difference they're still pretty bad and our grams per second just like at idle it's a little bit low I don't like that I think we have a problem with our mass airflow under reporting just a little bit and that's enough to throw these numbers off
and you can see our numbers are pretty close to the same at idle. Now I already cleared the codes and then ran it again when I plugged the Autel in. So let's see what, what's pending. Because the, the check engine light isn't on, but I could see that we had a fault. So let's look at it real quick. And you can see we still have a P0171. Even though we fixed a huge problem and dropped it down like 25 points, we still are over 30, which is going to set that check engine light on this vehicle. Uh, so, And this is a two-trip code, so that's why it's pending. We would have to um, tur turn the vehicle off, turn it on a second time, and get those trims up, those fuel trims too high above 30, and then this would set a permanent code. That's why it's still pending. All right, we're going to check the signal on our mass airflow real quick. And what we're going to check is uh, this E2G and the VG. That's our signal wire. The VG is our signal. E2G is going to be our signal ground. So from the mass airflow, pins 4 and 5, we're looking for the black with white and the gray wire. Pins 4 and 5. We'll back probe those two and look at our signals. All right, as you can see, I have pins 4 and 5 back probed right there on the mass airflow sensor. And I have it hooked up to the Vantage Ultra. I could use my little AES Wave U scope too, but we need some kind of scope to see the signals because they're too fast for a uh, for a DVOM. And so uh, right now with the key on, but the engine off, we're at uh, 0.32 volts. And so uh, we'll fire it up and we'll do a snap throttle test and uh, we'll check out the pattern, see what it looks like. All right, now we're just gonna do a couple of snap throttles and see what it looks like. All right, here's our signal from the uh, from that snap throttle test, and as you can see, here's our initial rush of air going in, then it drops just a hair, then it goes back up to our peak, and then comes back down. So that's a normal looking signal. I don't like this hash in here, but uh, but that's a normal looking signal as far as the pattern. And also, we only hit a maximum of 3.5. One was like 3.3, and one was 3.5. I'd like to see that just a little bit higher, closer to 4 if we could. So I definitely suspect that there's an issue with this mass air flow sensor just under reporting slightly, which is enough to throw our fuel trims off. And like I said, I could have easily used this uh, AES Wave U scope to, uh, to, to scope the signals, but I wanted to use this because it's a little bit easier to see on video. All right, got a brand new mass airflow sensor from Toyota installed. And you can already see that the voltage is a little bit higher just sitting here with the engine off. Let's go look at the data. All right, and as you can see with the engine off, our mass airflow sensor is 0.57, just like the old one was. So let's uh, fire up this vehicle, see what the fuel trims and the um, grams per second look like with it on. Now our engine's not quite warmed up, so our en engine speed's a little bit higher. But look at that, look at our short trim, short term fuel trim. It's already dropping like a rock. And our long term, look, it's already dropped to 5% and a minus 3. This thing has already fixed itself. It hasn't even gotten warmed up yet. All right, now that we're at an idle, we can see that our grams per second on the mass airflow is right around 3, just a hair under 3 or just a hair over, but right about 3. That's definitely a little bit better. And then look at our fuel trims. Short term is at 1.5, long term is at 
that's definitely a fix. That's well within our plus or minus 10% as our general rule of thumb. And it's well under the 30% that'll set the check engine light in this vehicle. So there you go, that's a confirmed fix. This thing needed a new brake booster and a mass airflow sensor. And as I raise the idle up, you can see our short, our short term has having to correct for the long term. See the long term at 28% and our short term is minus 20 because this long term is a learned number and it takes a while to get it to uh, go down. Actually this one's correcting pretty fast. But yeah, you can see how fast that's correcting. And while we're here, let's look, let's get our uh, engine speed up to 2500 and look at our grams per second on the mass airflow. You can see we're right about 2,500 and we're 9.5. Definitely, definitely looks much better than before. That mass airflow was just under reporting by a little bit, which is enough to throw this vehicle off. And you see when we go back down to idle? Fuel trim's almost perfectly zero. It's going to fluctuate a little bit, but you can see we're very close to zero. This is this vehicle's fixed. All right, now we'll do a couple more snap throttles, and we'll see how the signal looks this time. And look at that one. Although there was some hash in there, look at where we maxed out at. We maxed out at four. This one's looking good. All right, so here's here's with the uh, new mass airflow sensor. You can see we still have the same initial rush of air, and it drops down, and we do have a little bit of hash, just like the old one. But here's where it really shines. We get this nice uh, secondary rush of air, and we're up to four. Uh, volts and then it drops back down nice and clean that is definitely a much better looking waveform and that's a confirmed fix all right with the new mass airflow but with the old brake booster back connected let's go look at our fuel trims now all right you can see where our numbers are at long term is at plus 15 short term is at plus three so you can see we're almost 18 19 percent and you can see our mass airflow grams per second are just a hair lower than they were before. Probably because of this big vacuum leak that we've created. It's throwing off the airflow just a little bit. So you always got to keep that in mind. That a huge vacuum leak might throw your mass airflow sensor off just a little bit at an idle. Alright, let's raise the RPMs and see what it, our fuel trims do. If they get better, that would confirm a vacuum leak, which we already know we have one. And you can see our fuel trims got considerably better. Seven and minus two, minus three. Yeah, you can see we definitely have a huge vacuum leak out of that brake booster. All right, now let's keep an eye on our short term fuel trim. We're almost at 20%, but on our short term, let's see what happens when we step on the brakes create an even bigger vacuum leak. Alright, foot's on the brake. You can see our short term just went up to 20%. So we created an even bigger vacuum leak. So that definitely confirms our suspicions that we have a bad brake booster. And I just let off of it. And you can see it goes back down and stabilizes. So this vehicle also needs a brake booster. So as a quick recap, air comes in you know, and is used by the engine. And the amount of air that goes in is measured by this mass airflow sensor and told to the computer. And so in our case, 
it was falsely reporting. It was under reporting by a little bit, which was causing our fuel trims to go up. So the computer was having to add fuel. And we had a, another problem with the brake booster where that uh, the internals failed on it and it was sucking air into the engine. So this air that was coming from here was unmetered by the mass airflow. So that was even compounding the problem. So we had a mass airflow that wasn't reporting properly and we had additional huge air leak going into the engine and so that was causing massive amounts of uh, air into the engine more than the fuel that was going in there and so the computer was having to compensate. So you always have to remember just because you find one problem there might be another one. Alright now I need to get a new brake booster and get it put on there and as always the video helped you out or you liked it make sure to give it a thumbs up. Thanks for watching.